to have a real winter, uh, it kind of brings for a, a, a transplant in Minnesota and um, makes me real feel, feel real at home with um, uh, snow every other day and um, uh, enough to push around and hopefully not warm days that take it away until about the 25th of March and then it can just get green. Uh, so I think that we're so fortunate to, uh, to do so. I thank you all for coming this evening and welcome to uh, uh, this um, budget re reconciliation uh, gathering. I hear a few more visitors. I'll just hold for a minute so we can get everyone settled in and uh, uh, be ready to go. who just could not make it this evening, and that's why we're video recording this evening's session so that um, uh, individuals who couldn't be here uh, can catch up on, on it by uh, our sending them a, a copy of this, this evening's uh, presentation. I'm Stan Mack, uh, Superintendent of Schools, and I appreciate so much you being here this evening. We're going to take a little time to do some introductions and to go around, so um, you may see familiar faces or individuals you you know um, in the community, but I just wanted to make some very brief introductory remarks. Um, uh, the Board of Education and uh, uh, my executive team have um, uh, trusted me enough to try this experiment that hasn't been done for, before, at least in recent history, that anyone can reconstruct in uh, the Oshkosh Area School District. And that is to begin a process that I've been used to in dealing with budget reduction processes across uh, uh, other districts I've worked in and have found that uh, a uh, opportunity to engage the community in the discussions, knowing our plight, as I lovingly refer to it as admiring our, our problem uh, together, that we come to some wise decisions. In my uh, introductory letter in the, um, in the packet, orientation packet for tonight, I, I do remind you of the fact that uh, this is a um, very tough um, process to go through, and for any of you who volunteer to do this, uh, you're being brave, uh, that this is not easy work, but I have such a strong belief that many minds make better decisions than just a handful of minds together. And this process, um, uh, as uh, I've experienced before, has always been helpful in bringing greater wisdom to the process and greater own ownership to the budget uh, adjustment process uh, for a school district. So my thanks to all of you for participating in the process tonight and I appreciate very much uh, the issue of our approaching this with um, open minds, with uh, ideas, and uh, certainly anxiety and concerns because uh, this is a hard task to take under. The other issue that I wish to share with you is that your recommendations as we work through these two days and then um, three days uh, um, a week from now, uh, starting with the um, uh, with the 18th, 19th, and then we take off the night of the 20th and the 21st. We will uh, try to pull it all together. Will be uh, advisory to uh, to the executive team and myself, of which I need to then take your recommendations and formulate them so that they comply with law, that they make structural sense, so we can really operate the school district next year, and. Uh, to take them to the Board of Education for consideration uh, in their first board work session in March. So uh, you are an important part of this ongoing process of um, both um, reflecting on what we put together, generating ideas yourself, but giving us advice. Uh, listening is very important through this process. Uh, 
we, we want to make sure that we create an environment, um, you'll have less of that need tonight, but in future uh, meetings, of uh, being able to work together uh, to uh, hear each other and to approach it with um, civil conversations because uh, uh, the, the history of dealing with budget reductions in school districts that I've been in, and uh, unfortunately I can come in, and this is year one in Wisconsin, uh, but of the um, years 1982 through, um, uh, 19, uh, to, through 2009, 80% of the years that I've been in the superintendency, I've needed to deal with orchestrating and working through budget reductions. Now that's kind of sad commentary on school finance. but. Um, uh, when you think about 80% over that number of years, uh, it really does reflect on the issues that the needs, the demands, and the real cost of education um, have moved along at a faster rate uh, than the financing available in most all cases. And that's just not a Wisconsin issue. It is certainly has been a Minnesota issue. With that, opening remarks, I'm, before I turn the uh, program over to uh, our Executive Director of um, uh, Finance, uh, uh, and business services about test. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, ask to go around and um, have introductions so everybody kind of knows who's here and uh, uh, and uh, your um, your kind of background and work. Uh, we uh, appreciate hearing that, but uh, certainly you can share whatever you'd like as we go go along. With that, um, uh, Bob, I'll let you introduce yourself and then we'll go around. I'm Bob Tess. I'm the business manager here in Oshkosh. Okay. I'm James Warren. I teach fifth grade at Oakland Elementary School. I also live in Oshkosh and I have two daughters in the, in the school system. I'm Wayne Miller. Um, I was born and raised here. I graduated from North High School in 1976. Um, I left Oshkosh when I went to college. I have a master's in electrical engineering and MBA. <coughs> I moved back to Oshkosh five years ago. I'm Steve Cummings, Oshkosh Deputy Mayor, uh, lifelong resident of Oshkosh, as is my wife. I graduated from Oshkosh West, but my two children graduated from here. Dave Edwards, I have three daughters in the Oshkosh. Uh, Dick Sandler, I'm retired. <laughs> January 8th was my first day, so somebody had to tag me to do something. <laughs> I'm glad I could do it. I want to do something for the school district and the community that I serve. I don't know how many budgets I've done, but over 35 years I've been in government a long time. So anyway, if I can be of some help, I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Steve Walker, I teach orchestra at Merrill and Webster Stanley Middle School, and I also teach in the elementary strings program. I've been in the district uh, seven years uh, John Ryland, I've uh, been in the district 15 years. I'm a science teacher at Oshkosh West. I also live in the district. I live in Algoma uh, by Dick, pretty close here. Um, that's about it, I guess. Ken Candler, building custodian at uh, Oakwood Elementary School. Been in the district for 17 years. Jim Raceup, I'm with maintenance. I'm one of the carpenters. I've uh, been with the district 17 years now. <clears throat> Amanda Portraits, um, teach in the district, have four kids in the district, um, been here 12 years now, I think, overall. Randy Johnston, Director of Buildings and Grounds for the Oshkosh Area School District. Mike Bell, Director of Human Resources, and uh, my, my time here is in months. I've been here about eight months. <laughs> it's been good. <laughs> I'm Brenda Garrison, Rudin, principal at Carl Traeger Elementary. Prior to that, I was principal at Webster Stanley Elementary, and I taught there for a number of years as well. Michael Bennett, local business owner, uh, community, very in-depth. I also work with at-risk youth through the Riverside program on um, the alternative high school. Graduated from Oshkosh North in 1998, and I will have to apologize. I have to run out at about 6.45 tonight, so... <laughs> I'm Sarah Eliason. I've been here in Oshkosh for about 16 years. I've got kids in the school district, and I'm a tutor at Riverside and at North. My background is editing, writing, and communications. Uh, my name is Kathy Shear. Uh, I'm an attorney in private practice in Oshkosh, and it's been nine years here in 2000. And I have two children in the district. Um, I'm Amber Lineweber. I've been in Oshkosh. 
gosh, gosh, all of my life, went to Morgan, Webster, and, I mean, Washington, Webster, and graduated from North, graduated from Oshkosh, um, UW Oshkosh, going back to UW Oshkosh <laughs> to get my master's in educational leadership, um, married my high school sweetheart, who also graduated from Oshkosh, <laughs> so I went through the system. <laughs> My name is Chloe Crandall. I'm currently a student at UW Oshkosh as an urban planning major. Zach Bauer, uh, also a UWO student. Urban planning is also my major. Uh, went through all the Oshkosh school district. I'm Diane Friday. I work at Ocon and Emmeline Cook. Previous to that, I was a teacher for 20 years at Lakeside and Green Meadow. And my son also graduated from Oshkosh North three years ago. So. Uh, I'm Susan Martin. I work at Oakwood. I went to school here in Oshkosh, graduated from Oshkosh West. Uh, two years ago, graduated a student from here and just started a kindergartner this year. So. <laughs> Brian Wilson, band director at West High School. Uh, I've been in this district two years. Lisa Hunter, I've been in the district eight years, I have two kids in the district, and I do accounting software. I'm Stephanie Carlin. I spent 10 years working at the accounting firm Arthur Anderson. Um, now I do consulting work on a part-time basis. Three kids in the district, and significant experience with budget cuts in my own family. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Phil Marshall. I'm the principal at Webster Stanley Middle School. Um, I, this is my 20th year in the district. I was a teacher at Lincoln when it was open <laughs> and um, was the principal at Emily Cook for the last 10 years and just recently moved over to Webster Middle. So. I'm Ken Liske. Uh, my wife and I have lived in Oshkosh since 1999. We have two daughters, one at E. Cook and one at Alps. And I'm the director of music teacher education at UW Oshkosh. I'm Jim Evans. I'm a born and bred Oshkoshian, graduated from North in 77, so we probably have run into each other at some point, or at least know the faces. Um, I'm a local business owner downtown, um, uh, owner of the art house. My name is Eric Whiting. Um, graduated from Oshkosh West in 91. I have two kids in the district, and I'm a cash grain farmer. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Nick Bell. So I'm currently a student at UV Oshkosh studying political science history with a Russian language. And I currently swim for Oshkosh and my coach has some kids in the system slash I know. <laughs> 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 and I know some of the people in the system, so just learning the learning the budget and everything, see what I can do and kinda of learn some things from my community members. <laughs> uh, Justin Mitchell. Um, I work with the Oshkosh and Winnebago County Housing Authority. I've been there for about six and a half years. Um, prior to that, I spent two years with the county, and a year before that, I did an AmeriCorps VISTA in the school district uh, at Webster Stanley, building partnerships between the university and, and uh, the school district. I work with Phil and Brenna. Um, let's see, Alice, I'm the editor of The Scene. We launched that about a, month, or a year ago, the Oshkosh Scene, and some familiar faces here that we, we've covered and done some work together with. Um, I have a master's uh, in ed leadership from UW Oshkosh, and uh, I've been here for, I don't know, maybe 12 years, 10 years, um, sometime after 2000 we came. So. I'm Al LaRoe. I teach German language, literature, literature and culture at UW Oshkosh, and I've been here since 1996. Bill Stans, I teach at Oshkosh West High School. Uh, I've been there for 18 years. Uh, this is my 24th year of teaching. Uh, I teach uh, cap chemistry, and, and uh, that's something new for me this year. It's making me pretty challenged, uh, but uh, I just want to be part of this process, and hopefully I can learn something from everybody. Aaron Manders, I'm the principal at Webster Stanley Elementary School, and this is my second year. Jennifer Nason, I am a transplant to Oshkosh by the last eight-ish years, graduated from UW Oshkosh, and I have an early entry kindergartner in the system. David Seamers, interested and concerned citizen, and a political science teacher at UW Oshkosh. Tracy Thiel, I'm a teaching assistant in the district, and I have two daughters who graduated from West High School. 
I'm Kim Nguyen. Uh, I work on campus. I, I run the web infrastructure group there. Um, we've got two boys at Webster Stanley. I'm Lisa McLaughlin. I'm the principal at South Park Middle School, and I'm um, starting my <coughs> halfway through my 20th year in the district. I was at Oshkosh North High School here for four and a half years as a assistant principal. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Mike was here when I was here, and. Um, I have a son who's also a uh, first grader in the district. So. I'm Kim Brown. I'm the director of learning. I've been in the Oshkosh Area School District for 20 years, and I was born and raised here. I also have two sons that are in the district. Julie Mosher, director of curriculum and assessment. I've also been in the district for 20 years, and I have a son that attends Oshkosh North. Jackie Schleicher, interim principal here at Oshkosh North. Um, I was at Tipler for four years as a science teacher, and then I've been here at Oshkosh North as an AP, and now as the acting principal. Um, so to be continued, but welcome everyone. It's good to have you here. I'm Dave Benlock. I'm the deputy superintendent for the school district. I've been here for just over two and a half years. I'm Andy Jones. I'm the. That's my 25th year in education, and I'm the former principal of North, and now uh, assumed a new duty at Central Office as the Executive Director of Administration. So, welcome. I think we didn't miss a person. Um, to give you um, a little sense of uh, the mix here this evening, um, we had at last count, and it was a floating number that was going up and down of our citizen parent group, uh, roughly about uh, 24 individuals. We have 10 teachers. We have five support staff, including uh, uh, two um, uh, representing paraprofessionals. Uh, we have um, uh, 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 one re representing maintenance, one representing custodial, and um, uh, and there is um, we're we're still missing. Or if the person at the last minute, um, a clerical person, was able to join us, we um, the the name got submitted in a slightly different way, and so it didn't get into the system. But uh, we had five support staff and then five principals. Um, the rest of us that are um, uh, central office staff, we're, we're just simply here as facilitators. We're the ones that need to listen um, the most, and um, we're not um, uh, going to be really engaging in other than answering questions uh, through the process, but uh, uh, we'll be here um, each of the nights uh, working with you and responding to questions and clarification along the way. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Tess who is going to give us um, uh, School Finance 1001 for Oshkosh Area Schools. Yes. <laughs> I want to also repeat what Stan said earlier about thanking everyone for coming out. It's, uh, it's not always easy uh, to voluntarily sign up and participate in a process that you know isn't going to be all that much fun necessarily, which is probably not going to be. It says a lot about you, and it says a lot about how you care about the students in this community. Uh, if we keep that in mind while we're uh, while this process unfolds, that whatever we do here uh, in the next three or four weeks, we keep uh, students' best interest at the front of our mind and student learning at the forefront. I think this process will end a lot better for everyone. A couple of housekeeping duties. Everybody breathes right past the cooler of water we had set up, so uh, I will not feel bad if you get up in the middle of this meeting and you grab yourself a bottle of water. And if you do so, you may need the restroom. And Dr. Jones tells me there on the other side of this. Other side of this wall is a hallway. It's right in the middle of that hallway. So if you go down either either way, you come to it. There's a hallway on the back side. Okay. So now that uh, some housekeeping is taken care of. Uh, I'll apologize if I wander away from the microphone during the evening. I know uh, as a teacher in my former life, it's hard to uh, tether a teacher to a microphone unless you flip it on and let him walk around. So if I walk around a little bit, uh, I apologize. Dave, you're just going to have to let me know if the readings on the cameras are high enough audio so we can uh, pick up what I'm saying. As good a place to start as any is our, our calendar of work over the next month or so, the items up here in black you already signed up for, so you're pretty aware of what we're going to be doing with the items up here in black. Those are the nights that we're going to try to stick to 6 till 8, 30, maybe we can get done a little bit early. Uh, tonight we're going to give you a real general idea of what school finance is about. We'll mention some specifics about the Oshkosh Area School District. Looking around, I know some people have a, a lot of uh, 
uh, knowledge of school finance, but there are probably some people here that don't know a whole lot about school finance. You hear the term revenue limit. You hear the term uh, equalized aid. Uh, you hear a lot of these terms, you get a casual understanding of it, but you never really understand the essence of uh, school finance. Hopefully when we're done here tonight and tomorrow night and into the next month, you'll have a pretty good understanding of what public school finance is all about. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll uh, be willing to say that as, as people that are part of this committee, you will be in the 99th percentile of understanding school finance relative to your neighbors. Now, Mr. Spambar, you understand a lot of this already. John, Mandy, you were just at a workshop the last couple of days, so you understand quite a bit of it. The exec team, I hope you understand a, a little bit more than the common citizen, but we'll, we'll understand uh, at least the nuts and bolts of school finance. Uh, the red ones in there, the work that uh, this committee is going to bring to the board or committee of the board. I don't know about the March 21st. That's a facilities and finance meeting. Depending on what that committee wants to do, that might jump in front of the March 13th. It might go to the facilities and finance committee first and have a thorough discussion about what this group decides or at least brings to Mr. Mack as a recommendation. But ultimately, we're looking at March 27th. March 27th the full board is going to be voting on something. They're going to be voting on a reconciliation plan that started with its genesis with this group, eventually went to uh, a group of administrators, Mr. Mack, Facilities and Finance Committee, and then in front of the board. But the work that we're doing here is the genesis of, of that work that we're going to bring to the board on March 27th. We do only have a couple nights to talk about school finance, and we have to err on the side of being a little bit more simplistic than we would like to. If we had a semester-long graduate-level course, we would probably get a pretty thorough understanding of school finance. However, we only have one or two nights. We can make things simple, or we can make things thorough, and we really don't have time to make things thorough. We have to lean on the side of simple. We have to cut a little bit of corners, we have to oversimplify some things. We'll be talking about the revenue limit later on. If you've ever seen the revenue limit worksheet, it's about six font, and it's two pages long, and it's tiny, and it's got formulas that are linked to formulas that are linked to formulas. And if you really want to understand it, the DPI has some great resources out there, where I can spend some time with you, and we can go over revenue limit worksheets if you really want to. We're going to oversimplify that. We're going to talk about school funding, and we're going to boil it down to the general fund. Because for the purpose of this group, the general fund is what we're most interested in. There are some other funds that we use to track other expenses, but for the sake of this committee, I don't think we have much of a choice in the matter. We have to move things along a little bit more quickly. So we're going to tend to the side of being a little bit simpler and being a little bit quicker. Rest assured that the business department isn't quick and simple always. We're very thorough and we're very complete. And uh, just take comfort in that. Fund accounting, that's a general set of rules that we adhere to in public school finance, uh, generally accepted accounting principles that ask that we segregate all of our revenue and all of our expenses into separate areas. Some people call them buckets. The word buckets suggests that we're casual about it. I like to use the word basket. Basket suggests that we take a little bit more care in our finances. So we've got these different baskets called funds. And, uh, statutorily we're, we're required to segregate all of our expenses and revenue into these different areas called funds. We've got the special ed fund, sometimes you'll hear it called fund 27, or special ed, about 20.5 million dollars goes in and out of special ed every year. If you think that's a pretty big number, our entire budget is over 100 million. So it's the biggest other than fund 10, the general fund but it's still relatively small compared to the general fund. Referendum debt. When we need to borrow money to build a building like uh, uh, Jefferson, or the current building project going on right now, Oakland, we need to borrow money. We pay back that money usually over 20 years. The money that comes into Fund 39 is tax levy money, usually, and the money that goes out is like your house payment. But for us, it's a little bit bigger. This year it was a little bit unusual. We had a little bit of a large variance, which was uh, misbudgeting on the good side. We had extra money left at the end of the year. And in an effort to return that to the taxpayers, the board said, let's take this year's 
referendum debt payment of about $1.2 million out of the general fund fund balance and make a payment so we tax nothing for that. But usually it's about $1.2 million that we tax and $1.2 million that we pay for our house payment if you want to think of it that way. Or two homes, Jefferson and Oakland. Food service, $3 million budget, fund 50, food service. It's completely self-supporting. We take in money by selling meals. We take in money with federal subsidy uh, money. And it obviously costs money to run our food service. But for the purpose of this group, we're not really going to concern ourselves with food service because it's not the reason why we're in the position that we're in right now. <clears throat> I just advanced two slides. I wanted the big reveal with the general fund up here in glass. But my apologies. <laughs> community rec. Our community rec fund is about $1.3 million. And some communities have that through the school district, and some communities do it through the city. Uh, Oshkosh does it through the school district. Uh, many things that are offered citywide, not even to students, are run through the rec department. Uh, adult softball leagues, adult basketball leagues, some of those things are run through the rec department. But we also charge money to be in those activities. We also run things that are very much school related, like middle school sports. Middle school sports are run through the community rec department. And we do tax to support the community rec department. And it is tax outside the revenue limit, which we're going to talk about in a little while. We tax about a million dollars for community rec. And again, for the purpose of this committee, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about community rec, because it's not really the reason why we're in the position that we're in. Rest assured, we're not careless about community rec. We still do budget cutting, and we still tackle the austerity measures, and we still are uh, as, as careful as we can with all these other parts, but for the purpose of this committee, I don't think we really need to spend too much time talking about it. Then the big reveal, the general fund. The general fund represents $96.5 million worth of our budget. $96.5 million goes in throughout the year, not quite as regularly as we'd like it to. We get state aid coming in pretty uh, sporadically. We get uh, tax levy revenue coming in, very sporadic. In fact, a lot of you probably paid your property tax real recently because in the end of January, we got a big check from the city and from all the different municipalities for our property tax levy. So our, our income that comes into Fontaine isn't quite as regular as we would like it to be. And we'll talk about that in a little while. Another important aspect to understand with Fund 27 versus Fund 10, Fund 27 accepts $20.5 million throughout the year to run all of its programs. About $12.8 million of that money comes from the general fund. Special Ed gets a lot of revenue from categorical aid, some federal money, some state money, grants. A lot of it needs to be made up with Fund 10 money. $13 million worth, so out of $20 million, let's say, roughly, $13 million needs to come out of the general fund and subsidize Fund 27 in order for it to break even at the end of the year. <coughs> and if you're thinking, well, we should be talking about Fund 27 and some of the reductions there, there's a little rule called maintenance of effort. And maintenance of effort suggests that whatever you <coughs> contribute locally into Fund 27, you must maintain. So if it's $13 million this year that you have to dump into Fund 27 to support all the programs, and you cut a bunch of things in Fund 27, like Act 10 several years ago asked that we do, really, we had to support it with other programs that we added in order to keep the maintenance of effort equal to $13 million. Now, of course, we are cutting some corners again. That's not quite the whole story, but generally speaking, that's it. We need to keep funding Fund 27 with $13 million. You're going to see that tomorrow night. That's really not something that we can cut. And if we do cut it, we just have to replace other expenses in the same amount. So there's a big chunk that goes into Fund 27. It's kind of untouchable. So this is fund accounting, at least the general idea. If you're looking up there for where Fund 41 is and where Fund 38 is, and there's some oddball funds, Fund 73 we're talking about starting, Really, for the purpose of tonight, they really aren't that, aren't that important. There's a Fund 38 that lives inside of Fund 10. It's how we make debt payments inside of Fund 10. The 
we want to borrow money for our regular operations, we do it through Fund 38. But for all practical purposes, it's inside of Fund 10. All right, we've been on that one long enough. General fund balance. A lot is mentioned about fund balance, and some people might even make the remark, why don't you just spend fund balance and be done with it? Well, something people don't understand about fund balance is not just a big pot of money that just sits there throughout the year and doesn't get accessed. Again, our revenue is irregular at best. We get a bunch of money in December, we get a bunch more money in January, we get our next eight, eight payment at the beginning of the summer. We would love to get bi-weekly paychecks. But it just doesn't happen that way. And since our, our income, our revenue is so irregular, we need to short-term borrow. And in order to minimize our short-term borrowing, it's nice to have fund balance. Fund balance also suggests fiscal stability. When bond rating agencies want to sell bonds, or, or we want to sell bonds on their behalf, or, or through them, they, they rate us based a lot of times on fund balance. A district that has a minimal fund balance has to have enough other things going for it to get a good bond rating. We happen to have a lot of things going for us, and fund balance is kind of in the middle. It's, it's smaller than some, it's bigger than some. <clears throat> so when we talk about fund balance, if somebody says you have fund balance of 12 million or you have fund balance of 15 million, they're really only talking about your balance, your leftover in that middle big pot as of January 1. At the end of the fiscal year, how much money is in your checking account, so to speak? And at the end of the last year, we had about $12.3 million in our checking account. And the reason we can't just spend that on all of the things that we're going to be cutting, possibly, we need to keep it because by October 20th, if we would not have borrowed anything, it would be down to zero. Because we haven't gotten our revenue yet. So by October 20th, we're at zero. So what would you do if that were your own finances? <coughs> Go to the payday loan place, right? Maybe be more wise with uh, pursuing a better interest rate, but you'd have to borrow money to make your mortgage payment, your car payment, and everything else that you need to buy. We're no different. We engage in something called short-term borrowing sometime before October 20th, before it's down to zero, we borrow 10 or 15 million dollars to keep us going for the rest of the year. If we would not borrow anything, by January 21st, we would have been down to negative 11.2 million dollars. And then January 21st, all of your tax payments start to end up in our office, and then we have enough money for the rest of the year. So this year we borrowed right around 12 or 13 million dollars to avoid that from happening. Does that make sense? So fund balance really only talks about that balance in your account at that one point in time, July 1st. And it's necessary for fiscal stability and telling others that you're fiscally stable, bond rating agencies in particular. You can weather some ups and downs. If Randy Johnston has a boiler go up in the middle of the winter, it's nice to know that you have a little bit of fund balance because we do borrow a little bit more than we need. And there are ups and downs in our cash flow. Right now there's an up. So if Randy loses the boiler now, we're in pretty good shape. If you lose the boiler when we're at our low point, maybe not so much. Uh, and it, promote, it, it just says you're fiscally stable. Here, here is some data from some other school districts. This is the most recent data that we have for everyone. I, I didn't think it was fair for me to update the Oshkosh bar graph and not update the others. But Oshkosh was at 9.5 and 10.11, and we've gone up to about 12% of our operating budget. So 12% of our operating budget is fund balance. There are many districts that have larger fund balance, but it's, it's a lot of personal preference. Dr. Gunlock's from Menasha, or he used to work in Menasha. He will tell you Menasha just had a, a, a habit of not engaging in short-term borrowing. They, they made sure they had enough money on hand that they didn't have to short-term borrow. So their low point maybe went down to $2 million, and it went back up, it went back down. They didn't have to short-term borrow. There are some districts that don't mind short-term borrowing, and they just make it clear that they're going to do that. Menasha's, by the way, right now is down from what Dr. Gunlock tells me. They're spending some money, aren't they? They're spending some of their fund balance. <coughs> revenue limit. A lot is mentioned about the revenue limit, and in a more general sense, all revenue sources are limited. If we think we can tap into some of the private industry in town for revenue, it's limited. If we think we can raise student fees, it is limited. 
if we think we can put a great football team on the field at Pac Titan Stadium every Friday, it, it's still limited. Every bit of our revenue is limited to a certain degree. Now, sometimes we talk about the formal word revenue limit, and that is a little bit more of a strict meaning. Some of the other limits to our revenue are a little bit more of a soft limit. But every one of our, our limits, our, our, our sources of revenue are limited. The revenue limit, in its most strict sense, is made up of uh, property tax for Fund 10 only and the state equalized aid amount. And we'll show you that with a picture to make it maybe a little bit more clear. For this current year, our revenue limit is $92.3 million. Now, keep in mind, that's not an expense limit. You can spend any amount you have. If you can get your hands on money, you can spend it. There is no limit to expense. There's really no limit to revenue. There's only a limit to part of your revenue. The part of your revenue that's made up of state aid and your property tax for your general fund. It's your property tax for general fund. We tax all the hardworking taxpayers and the state aid that we get from Madison, which people think, well, that's free. It's coming from Madison. Well, it's not really free because we're all paying for that too. We're all residents of the state of Wisconsin. So it's not free. But if you don't <coughs> use it, there are other districts that are glad to use it. So. Relatively speaking, I guess it's more free than the property tax. But these two make up the revenue limit. If this revenue limit gets bigger and state aid doesn't get bigger, what needs to happen? The whole barrel gets bigger and the state aid stays the same. Limited property tax will go up if you want to recognize your full revenue limit. Now, the current governor has gone on record saying he doesn't want that to happen. He doesn't want what he's doing down in Madison, ending up with higher taxes for property owners back home. So if he recommends, when he unveils the budget on February 12th, if he recommends that this revenue limit formula, we're going to talk about it in a little while, the revenue formula makes the revenue limit bigger, it's a pretty sure bet that the state aid is going to have to come along for the ride at least a little bit. I don't know if you agree with that, but, but generally speaking, that's unpredictable, really. <laughs> it is. And we're going to show a couple scenarios that illustrate the unpredictability of it. Uh, but but if, if this whole thing goes up, and this doesn't go up, taxpayers are going to get it. <coughs> so if this goes up, hopefully this goes up in proportion so this doesn't shoot through the roof. Now what about the rest of the revenue that we have? It's pretty small in comparison. We've got this big basket of revenue over here that's governed by the revenue limit, and that's what's causing pressure on our budget right now. And then we've got free run of this. We can raise as much revenue over here as you want. But it's tough to raise revenue in the amount of millions. 2.9 million is all we raise in revenue aside from this. In the general fund, here's some things that make up the other 2.9 million. Open enrollment tuition. Someone open enrolls into Oshkosh. We get tuition for that. Uh, Dr. Gunlock's smiling back there. I don't know if he has something to add, but we also have to pay open enrollment to other right. districts when our students leave. We lose about, a, I believe, a million dollars is budgeted that is a drain on our budget. So we net lose a million to open enrollment right now because we net lose 100 kids uh, to other districts right now. Which is a little bit less than that, probably around six or it was seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. But right now, uh, the amount of money that comes in through the open enrollment program versus the money that goes out through the open enrollment program, Dr. Perlock is correct. It's a significant amount. We're a net 100 student loss district. And sometimes there's a misperception that if we lose kids to open enrollment, that we don't get taxed for those kids. You do. You get taxed. We bundle the money up and we ship it with the students to the next district. So you're still being taxed for every one of the kids who live physically in the Oshkosh community. And then of course student fees and library aid and title funding and SAGE funding and all of that stuff adds up to only two point nine million relative to the big picture. I don't know if that's going to scale or not. We're trying to make it close. Okay, but it's a pretty small amount in comparison. So is it important to understand this revenue limit part of our puzzle? Very important to understand that part. Calculating the revenue limit. Just when you want to see that tiny print revenue limit, court sheet, 55 dollars. You're not going to see it. It's going to be oversimplified. 
and to try to simplify it down to the basic concept. Essentially, we have an old revenue limit from last year. Say it's $90 million. And we got a uh, number of students from last year. It really isn't that accurate because it's a three year average, but it's last year and the previous two. So it's kind of old student enrollment numbers. We've got an old revenue limit number and an old number of students. And we divide the two to get how much it costs for one student. And then the news coming out of Madison allows us to add a certain amount per student. That number has been as high as $274 as recently as 2009. So in 2009, we divide it out, we get the cost per student, and then out of Madison came the news that you add on $274 to each one of those students, and now you get a new cost per student. And it's been as low as negative $519. So that revenue limit went down $519 two years ago. The current year that we're in the midst of right now, last summer, it went up 50. So it went up 50. But historically, it's gone up in the 200s. So we don't know where we're at right now. New biennial budget coming out. We're going to find out hopefully a little bit more on February 12th if it's going to go up at all and how much it's going to go up. So you add on the per pupil amount. Now you get a current revenue per students, student. But you may have more students. So you calculate the new <coughs> enrollment, which is this year and the previous two, so it's updated one year, and you multiply it out, now you get a new revenue limit. So how's that revenue limit go up? A couple things can go up. Here's data for this current year. Last year, our total base revenue, $89.5 million. That was our old revenue limit. This was our old number of students. It's not really students, it's membership, and some students come on half to point four, but students, generally speaking. <coughs> so essentially, we had a revenue limit of $9,000 per student. We got to add $50 to that. So we added $50, but we had fewer students. So sure, you gained $50 per student, but you had fewer students. So our revenue limit actually did go up a little bit, 89.5 to 89.6. Did it go up because we had more students? No, it went up because we added $50 per student. And all across the state, people are speculating what that number is going to be on February 12th. And some business managers are projecting zero, some are projecting 200, and a lot are projecting a lot of places in between. I think the DPI is making a recommendation of $215 or something like that, but uh, very few are hopeful that that's going to happen. Now, just to make this a little bit more fun, that's, uh, here's a spreadsheet that essentially has the same math with the red numbers that you can change. Last year's revenue, we're really not changing it, but it is a, it is a factor. We could change that if we did some things a while back. Right now, we really can't change it. Base enrollment, can we do something to change that? Well, base enrollment is last year and the two previous years, so you really don't have much control over that. Can you change the per pupil adjustment? Maybe not locally, but you can maybe influence some people that could change. Mr. Spamler, we could have had this conversation with you a year ago. We, it, it's possible. People come to you and talk to you all the time about, hey, can we get that revenue limit up? And I've talked to all our local people, and yeah, we'll do what we can. And they are. They're doing what they can. But we could maybe increase this. Maybe increase it to 100. Take a look at this lower right-hand number, what happens when it increases to 100. So now this just went up $600,000. If it goes up to $200, now increase 1.5. So those are significant numbers. What if we recaptured the 100 students we lose? 99.47. Okay, take a look at the numbers. 1.5 now it went up to 1.9 million. Okay, if you end up being a winner, you know, really significant. Now you're winning here and you're going to win here. You're increase your revenue limit with more students, you're going to increase your revenue limit with the per pupil adjustment. So that per pupil adjustment is a pretty important number. And it's something we're all going to be focusing on until February 12th. Well, maybe even a little bit beyond that until the state budget is finalized. <coughs> Any questions on that one? Yes. How is it possible to recapture that? Well, if students re-enrolled and came back, or if we captured students from other districts who wanted to come here, one of the things we just started is, uh, is our own uh, virtual school, at, or 
inside of both west and north, and um, we've already seen a few students start to come the other direction. We have a long way to go, obviously, but we're just in our beginning stages of dealing with some of that. The other thing is, is uh, the more attractive our education system is, uh, you know, in relation to our comparables, that makes that a little bit easier. And the converse is true. If if we offer a, a, a product here and everybody else is still offering a product up here, that number could go in the opposite direction pretty quick. Racine went from a net 100 loss to a net 300 loss in, I believe, one year. So it can go pretty fast. We have to become a destination that people want to send the kids to. You guys, we're all looking at my next slide right here. <coughs> Increased enrollment. Do this by providing a sustainable quality product, and it'll sell itself. And people will come, and the people that are currently maybe leaving will stick around. And it's important to keep that in mind as this process that we're in the midst of unfolds over the next month and a half. We're going to be faced with a lot of tough decisions. And it's easy to look at the hard savings for reducing a program. And it's hard to capture the soft savings. And it's easy to ignore the soft savings. But the soft savings are, by reducing a program, five or six students leave, and $15,000, $20,000 go along with those students. So it's important to keep that in mind throughout this process, that taking away programs could also have the result of taking away students. And I didn't put the state aid formula up here, but similar to the revenue limit formula, the state aid formula is driven a lot by number of students. And the more students you get, at least for us in tertiary aid, and only get into that, leads to more revenue. So start driving students out of town, it hurts you two different ways, revenue limit and state aid. Uh, per pupil increase via the state budget, you maybe are already a part of a lobbying group that lobbies people in Madison to maybe increase that a little bit. Uh, you don't have to be part of a lobby group. You can do your own work to maybe convince people down there to increase that revenue limit. Uh, energy efficiency exemption. The last box on the previous slide was that was your revenue limit without exemptions. <coughs> there are some oddball exemptions. There's a declining enrollment exemption, which, which uh, kind of protects you if your enrollment goes down. You don't get hit with that till the next year. So there's a declining enrollment exemption, and there's this thing called the energy efficiency exemption. Or if you followed the work that the board was in the middle of this summer, uh, you're allowed to tax additional money and raise your revenue limit for energy efficiency work. And our board passed a resolution to do $21.5 million worth of boilers, roofs, uh, uh, tuck pointing, some building envelope work. It qualifies for the energy exemption, energy efficiency exemption. So our revenue limit is going up a little bit for things such as that, that's already been earmarked. We can't take that money and use it for something else. We already said we're going to be using that money for energy efficiency work. But we can't start using that for some of the things that we're considering in the next several nights. Operational referendum. Uh, some people are afraid to say the R word. Uh, just got to get it out there. It's an option. An operational referendum is taxpayers giving the district the authority to increase revenue limit in spite of what comes out of Madison. So Madison may say zero, but the local taxpayers might say, we want to raise it $5 million. And local taxpayers have the authority to do that through referendum. And this re revenue limit started in 1993, and there are a lot of people that complain about the revenue limit. And whatever happened to you in 1993, you were kind of stuck with, because that was the base year. And it went up a little bit, and it went up a little bit, and it went up a little bit. But local school districts had the authority all along to trump what happened in 1993 by passing an operational referendum to raise it. So it's not totally the fault of whatever happened in 1993. The taxpayers have the authority to raise that revenue limit. Now, I don't think it's realistic to think about raising the revenue limit for next year for, through referendum. We just don't have time to do that. But at least keep that in mind. That's an option. Uh, Different from a building referendum, the building referendum that we passed last year to build Oakland has nothing to do with the revenue limit, really. It's additional money that we're going to need to tax to make our bond payments, our house payments, so to speak, on Oakland, but it doesn't impact our revenue limit at all. Different type of referendum. Any 
here's a just a reminder of how big of an issue the revenue limit is in comparison to everything else. The rest of that revenue is pretty small in comparison. Hey, how about if I turn it over to Kim Brown, hey, Director of Learning, and she's going to walk you through a little activity. All I'm going to ask you to do is, there's been a lot of information shared so far about the revenue limit and some other information, and we just want to make sure that everybody's feeling good with that information. So I'm going to actually ask you to stand up and find a partner, and I want you to talk about one thing that you have learned and any questions that you may have. <coughs> And then we will share out some of those questions so everybody is feeling good about that information. Okay, so stand up and find your partner. <laughs> spending um, to the amount allowed by state law every year. And consequently, uh, we are held back. We can't, you, if you don't um, raise your, your limit um, to the state limit each year, you cannot make up for it in future years. So if you're 1% behind um, one year, and the next year, you take advantage of the increase of 1%, you're still 1% behind the other school districts. And that 1% continues, carries on forever. Is that correct? Yeah, here's, here's a and, and is, part of all. And isn't, doesn't that also, and the only way to get around that would be through that referendum we talked yeah. about. And if, if a school system on more than one, in one, one year, a, num a number of years, numerous years, continues not to raise its spending um, up to the limit that the state allows for the increase, um, then over time, the system is not providing uh, as much of an ed education as it could and risks losing students which then causes the um, school system to lose more money uh, by virtue of having to ship that money to other school systems. So in, a, in essence, you've got a magnifying effect yes. for not staying at the state allowed limit. It seems to yes, you, just you really almost, uh, take off. You sound like a plant bag in the audience almost. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Never met you before, um, and uh, <laughs> I've been saying that for a while, and it's for the most part pretty accurate. This is from our budget booklet from this year, and this is a, a visual picture of those years that we did choose to under levy, and it was in the 90s possibly, but it's more recent than the 90s as well. In fact, here are two years that we under levied by $2 million each of those two years, pretty recently. And the blue represents money that we could have taxed and we could have addressed some of our deferred maintenance in particular. We could have addressed maybe maintaining some of the programs that we cut in that particular year. 
as you'll see later, I don't know if it's tonight or tomorrow, we cut that year too probably. And here's another $2 million that we could have used to address uh, some of our needs. Now, part of what you're saying isn't quite true because uh, your revenue limit is made up of a base, and then you've got some non-recurring exemptions that add on. And a non-recurring exemption is something that's not going to carry over to the next year if you choose to use it or not use it. And in this particular year, the last $1.9 million was a non-recurring exemption for declining enrollment. So our enrollment went down. We didn't want to, they, they protect us against that. We don't get the hit until the second year. So our enrollment went down. We got a declining enrollment exemption of about $1.9 million. So our revenue limit went up $1.9 million. It's non-recurring. You don't get credit for it next year again, whether you use it or don't use it. So what happens to it, it comes back off after the next year. So in that case, it didn't have this compounding effect because it was a non-recurring referendum or non-recurring uh, exemption that you could not have carried into the next year. It still represents $1.9 million that you could have spent on something that year that you chose not to. It represented maybe a part of a boiler that we could have done that year, and then we wouldn't have to dedicate so much to a boiler this year. So most of what you're saying is true, but that non-recurring part is kind of a catch where it doesn't quite impact you on this magnifying exponential basis entirely because the non-recurring comes off every year anyway. What's the total amount of under levying over the past 20 years? Well, if we look, you're under levying 1.1 million, 1.5 million, 1.4 million, 1.9 million, 2.1 million. So I've got two, four, six, eight, ten million in those ten years. So, yeah, that's ten million dollars worth of things that we could have done during those years. But at the same time, take a look at what the mill rate was doing here. And the mill rate was going up, and I know we passed the referendum, I think it was here, that gave us additional revi revenue <coughs> limit authority that we didn't capture because you probably remember what happened with the economy about the same time. And to have the uh, political fortitude to make your levy go up 13%, as a matter of fact, that was my introduction to Oshkosh. <laughs> showed up in August, and by October, I was asking the community to increase their levy 13%. How do you think that went? <laughs> Not very well. So the board protected me, <laughs> the board under levy, and it went up, I think, 8 or 9 that year. It still was pretty big. And we're still getting some follow-up, because what did the community say just prior to that year? Passed a referendum saying, increase your levy by $1.3 million. And what did we do? We chose to not completely ignore what the community said because there were other factors that came to light after the referendum was passed but they chose to under levy but you're right it does have an effect if we would have levied our full authority throughout time we could have tackled a lot more projects yeah the other uh, problem you have through the last so probably five six years uh, is the fact property value has gone down and that mm -hmm. causes also the mill rate to go up so you don't have that income coming Back in the 90s, around 93, 94, I know I've talked to people over the past few years, things were good. The economy was picking up. Uh, they had uh, money to finance whatever activities going on. And nobody gave it a thought that we'd be <coughs> shut out in another 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, levies and revenue limits and the whole bit. So uh, there's a reasoning for that 93, 94 as things uh, wasn't that people were forgetful or didn't care. Uh, it was just the fact that uh, things were good and they figured, hey, we're doing good with the revenue we're getting now, we're okay. But property value, that's the number one thing I would say right now is hurt, that no rate. Yeah. And what we're showing here is the actual levy amount, not necessarily the mill rate, but you're right. If property values are going up, you can keep your mill rate the same and increase your levy over time because you're splitting it up over a larger tax base. So you're right, that declining uh, property value the last three years is really playing a role in this. Does that answer it? And well, not you, may, you want to make a comment, I think you've got a problem. My only question is, uh, um, have you at, at all been able to estimate the number of students lost for, say, every million dollars uh, under levy? Can you do that? Well, we can estimate the number of students lost. Easy enough. You know, we had a graph during the Oakland referendum uh, campaign, so to speak, where we shared that information.
attaching the reason for the loss of students is a little bit more difficult. Could you say it was due to decreased revenue and uh, limiting, limiting their number of programs? It's a possibility. Could you talk about the local economy and jobs and parents taking kids with them and leaving them? Leaving, you could make that argument. So attaching the reason for why students are leaving is, we found that to be a little more difficult than one area where we did have some data that would point to that was uh, when we looked at by school area where we lost kids, we lost a lot out of the uh, the Oaklawn attendance area. I mean, significantly out of the Oaklawn attendance area. So that would lead one to believe that whatever was occurring there was frustrating our customers, if you will, enough that they chose to buy their product elsewhere. And uh, that, that we do have as far as that information, but to tie it to actual X dollar under levy equals X students lost, I don't think we could do that. Any other questions? And this is the budget booklet. We have a spot for this later on in the show. I'm just trying to get back on track here. Let's see, will we write about here? So are there remaining questions, sir? The $96.5 million in the general fund, is that after or before the $12.8 million is taken out? That's or before. It's before. before. Yeah. I think it comes up tomorrow night. I'm, I'm going to show you how much really is available for this committee to mull over. And you start with the $95 million, you take out $12 million, transfer to fund 27, the number gets considerably smaller. You talk about the amount of money that we transferred into out of Fund 10 into Fund 39 to pay for our referendum debt gets a little bit smaller yet. Some of our revenue uh, is, is very closely attached to an expenditure, our title funding. You get title funding, you spend it on specific uh, programs. Sure, you can cut the program, you cut the revenue along with it if you do that, so that's off the table. So you start looking at the number that you have available to cut, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and then you think about, we're, we're in the uh, business of increasing people's human capital by using human capital. We use teachers to increase human capital in students. So it doesn't come as a surprise that 80% of our expenditures are personnel. We spend a lot of money on personnel. You may not see that in industry. But we use human capital to increase other people's human capital. So 80% of our, of our budget, personnel, salary and benefits. And we haven't done a lot with salary and benefits other than the last two years. The last two years we did a lot with salary and benefits. But prior to that, what's the part of our budget that got picked and picked and picked and picked and picked? It was the 20% part. So the 20% part is, it's really been analyzed. And you'll see another graph, historical budget reductions, 10 or 15 years worth of reductions, many of which came from that 20% part of the pie. That state uh, revenue, when you get that in October, are you paying any part of that uh, to debt as far as what you finance, I should say? Uh, not the one in October, but I think this year we broke it up into two separate uh, <coughs> payments and two separate, uh, are certainly two separate payments. We'll make one payment when we're at a high point in our cash flow, and then we'll make one payment at the end of the summer. Let me ask it this way. Are you paying a debt off completely, or are you making interest payments with that revenue? We are making a half of a debt off entirely. More than interest. And some years, depending on where our cash flow situation is, and depending on the rates at which we borrowed, it is not in our best interest to split it into two different issues. There's the issue of uh, a bond that matures in January and another bond that matures in July. There are additional costs that come along with two issues. So sometimes we issue two bonds, sometimes we issue one. This year we had issuing two, one matured in, I think, January and one matured in July and August. How much interest are you paying? Uh, if I say the number right now, a lot it's going to be off, and I'm not going to commit to that. It's probably $200,000. I don't know. Well, I meant percentage-wise, like 7%, 7.5%, 8 Closer to 3 Oh, that's that one? Yeah, it's, it's pretty low. And I, again, I say it out loud, I commit to it, now it's wrong, because I know it's wrong, it's just a matter of how much it's wrong. <laughs> but uh, it, it's... We're getting pretty competitive rates right now. Yeah. But back in the day, people would borrow as much as they could get away with because they were earning very good rates. The school districts could borrow from very, very cheap, and they could earn a lot of money, and they were making money with their short-term borrowing. Well, it depends on your bond rating, too, what interest rate you get. Double A2 now, so it's next highest from the top. So. Um, I had a question about 
about the maintenance referendum. I guess that was a few years ago. I think I saw in the paper a recent editorial about how we, you guys were planning to use that money. Could you explain a little bit? Sure. And Randy, you can add if you, if you want also. We passed a referendum in 2009 to exceed the revenue limit again by $1.3 million each of five years. $6.5 million. So again, the revenue limit is what it is by the formula. And then the voters gave us additional authority of $1.3 million. And at that time, I wasn't here, so I can't take credit for it, passing it or putting together the list. But there was a list that was suggested to the public in an information campaign that if you vote yes, we'll do this, this, and this. But the actual referendum question was probably a little bit more vague. It probably said something about to address deferred maintenance needs and left it at that. But at the same time, we have an obligation to hold to our promise during the information campaign of what we said we were going to do in 2009. So we just shared with our Facilities and Finance Committee a couple of weeks ago exactly what that list was in 2009. All the items that we took care of on that list from 2009, we put in green a couple items that we did additionally that weren't necessarily on the list in 2009, but we still had money available and there were still needs. Believe me, our deferred maintenance list is bigger than 6.5 million. It's debatable. Depends if you ask which Northwestern reporter even. It could be 70, it could be 100. It depends on how you define it. If you define it and include the windows at West High School, it can get pretty big. But if you only include boilers and roofs, it can get a little bit more under control. Uh, but we had enough need, so we tackled a couple other projects because I mean, it was a good time to do some of these projects. And we could finance them for a little bit cheaper, and bids came in uh, low. And through Randy's efforts and the efforts of the whole department, uh, we saved enough to do other projects. And I don't know exactly what they were. There was a roofing project thrown in there, maybe a window project thrown in there. We took some money and put towards uh, one of the boiler projects. We took it, put it towards build, building envelope. Uh, there were some lighting projects that were a uh, quick payback on that also. Uh, so there's a lot of extra projects that we had done that were able to capture energy savings and the extra money that we got came in and underbid on a lot of projects. And so now we're at the end of this, this five years. It's coming up real close. As a matter of fact, next year is the last year we have the additional revenue limit authority. So this coming summer is really the last uh, project summer we're going to have. And we've got some money left over, so to speak, to speak casually. And we asked the Facilities and Finance Committee what they would recommend that we put together for a plan. They haven't voted on it yet. And there's talk that maybe uh, school security would be uh, it's, it's at the forefront of a lot of conversations right now. And maybe school security is something we could use some remaining dollars for. Maybe it's another roof project. Maybe it's a part of another boiler project. Uh, and the initial uh, conversation was we were, we were going to think about security. And uh, a lot of people are very concerned about security right now, understandably so. And how we're going to fund our security initiatives is almost another issue, but I think we're going to do something. And I don't know if Mr. Mack wants to say something, but we're having those discussions daily. And that would provide a perfect opportunity. We have the additional revenue limit authority. We were very careful about how we spent that money, and we're at the end of the projects, and we've got this money left over, and all of a sudden we have a pretty big need for security. Just Rick Weish. What, what we have received, of course, since some um, uh, the um, uh, Connecticut uh, elementary school issue has been an increased level of uh, anxiety regarding schools and what we explored were what was the what could we do uh, we know that um, uh, the target for most schools was to get to what um, uh, uh, that elementary school was that being a locked secure front door with uh, electronic entrance and um, that was our goal was to, to get to uh, that level of security. We know that if you have a person with the behavior and intent that that individual in Connecticut there uh, unless we um, unless we create um, perimeters around our schools and make them look like um, prisons on the outside or we go to bulletproof glass and all bearing things that uh, for every window because if you guard the front entrance if, if it's uh, too secure not too secure, Windows always become the next target. So we were looking at establishing one uh, a perimeter that basically is uh, security at front doors with 
um, cameras and a buzzer system that could be controlled from a uh, secretarial desk um, and with showing proper ID, camera that's flexible enough to deal with um, uh, uh, being able to pick that up and to record it. And in fact, uh, Dr. Gunlock is um, working on process um, to have the appropriate story so we could record and save everybody who comes to the door um, with ID, all those kind of things. We believe we can do that. Um, we're analyzing whether or not we um, uh, uh, become contrarians with the Northwestern or we find other dollars available uh, through um, Randy's maintenance budget. But the commitment is that we need to explore a means of securing our schools um, at the front door in every location. Remember, our newest schools, uh, Jefferson um, uh, and um, in Oaklawn, and, uh, and certainly um, um, uh, Traeger Elementary and Middle, all have offices right near the front door. Um, but you can walk a block and a half in, in, at uh, West High School before you get to the principal's office. You, uh, most of our schools, um, there's some distance. Well, the bond issue was defeated um, back at the same time that operating referendum by some less than 100 votes that would have required a full remodeling moving offices. It was for, I believe, two and a half million dollars in that range to do that. But in this, uh, the technology today, without moving offices, but using good electronic technology uh, that is now available with great cameras and with uh, 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 communication devices back to um, desks, we can create effectively that same environment without moving those offices to the front doors and effectively control entrance because bearing in mind that we always lock um, our school doors all except the one single or main entrance and in our high schools, um, uh, Jackie, do we, we have, uh, where is Jackie? Here? We have two entrances here for entrance, or one? One right one, now. One right now. One, yeah. And West has two um, entrances, and, um, uh, but the goal would be to secure and lock them down and have person at a main desk far away from the door, so if there's somebody with malintent, we will know by a lack of identity and the like to be able to deal with it. In either case, it would be irresponsible, and our board has really taken the belief that we need to do, deal with the issue, and we believe we can do it regardless of fund source. And the North, uh, Northwestern took the interpretation that, um, uh, that uh, security is not deferred maintenance. Well, I think there's, there's a little room for thought on that, that issue. That is deferred maintenance. It's, um, it's a maintenance project. But um, if you want to go fundamental on the issue, we'll find another source. But we have to do that, and we will do that. Um, in preparation for the next school year. So um, if you're interested, uh, tune in. We'll have a security, um, a local firm that um, uh, uh, will be uh, presenting to the board in their board work session on uh, February 13th and sharing information because we're excited about being able to deal with that. It will also free up in secure areas so that we don't have to have paraprofessionals or other persons at the front door or at the door checking people out. They can do it at a distance, they can do it remotely, and they control who has access to the building. You know, simply vagrants, you know, per persons not with guns, people can right now with the front door entrance can kind of wander into the building as a warm place. Well, the reality is we want to control that as well, and that's a security issue that's essential. So ignoring security will not be there, but um, it's a great question because uh, the debate is um, which fund should it come from? But it would be inexcusable for us to not tackle uh, a level of basic security for our buildings uh, at every front door or every main door of, of every building in the district. I think we're going to have to keep them moving in order to get people on, up and out by 8.30. I feel bad advancing a slide while Mr. Mack is talking. It's like starting the music while they're saying they're thank you. At least you didn't have a cane here with a hook, right? <laughs> Here's a visual I've shared before, maybe you've seen it, it's in our budget booklet. This is our mill rate comparison uh, relative to other school districts our size, they're listed down here, and also the statewide average. And you can see the statewide <laughs> average, it goes up and it goes down, and our comparables go up and go, to, go down. But in Oshkosh here, we track a little bit lower than everybody else, still going up and down at the same time. Everybody else went down, ours went down. And this gap, represents between five and six million dollars in revenue every year. 
So if you could snap your fingers and get us back to our, what our comparables are at, that's five or six million dollars, about five and a half million dollars. Depends, I don't have everybody else's data this year. Five and a half million dollars additional revenue every year. So can you snap your fingers and do it? No. Can you pass a referendum and do it? Yes, it's not really an issue here. But uh, over time, that could have been addressed. And if, and if that gap were closed, we wouldn't be having this discussion this evening or the next five nights. <coughs> and the total cost per member. DPI measures this. How much do you spend per student to educate your students? And here in Oshkosh, we do it more economically than our comparables and the state average. The gap's closing a little bit. We just passed the referendum, too, so our spending did go up a little bit. So it doesn't come as a surprise. Our spending went up a little bit. Maybe everybody else has been up as much. But there's a gap. We're doing things more economically here in Oshkosh than everyone else is. But yet our property value is the same. So our property value tracks that of our comparables per student. Of course, the black, the state average, per student state averages are a little bit higher because you have some small districts that uh, skew the statistics a little bit. You've got northern Door County, you've got northern Wisconsin, you've got some small districts that have huge per pupil property values. But if you consider the metropolitan areas and some of our comparables, yeah, we're about the same as everybody else, property value. But yet we tax a buck and a quarter less than everybody else. I'm going to look at our budget in a very oversimplified uh, approach in the next few minutes here. If you want a more uh, involved look at our budget, you can look at our website and access the, the uh, budget booklet. You can go on the DPI site and you can access anybody in Wisconsin's budget, not the booklet, so you won't get the narrative, you won't get the explanation. You'll get a lot of uh, codes and a lot of uh, clandestine information that you have a hard time figuring out. But if you want the narrative that comes along with it, you can access the book. And we already had it up here, but I'll just call it up again real quickly. Here's the kind of information that's in our budget booklet. You've got information on each school. You've got short narrative that's easy to understand for different concepts. <coughs> it's pretty easy to understand. And then, of course, there's some data. And here's the guts of our budget. Uh, eventually, you know, there's that revenue limit worksheet that I was talking about before. That's a pretty complicated uh, set of formula. Uh, some graphs. Here, here's a lot of the nuts and bolts of our budget. And this is even uh, broken down on a 20,000 foot level. If you want more information, you can go to the DPI to get more information. I'm sharing some information with you here tonight that I didn't share in the budget booklet. So if you picked up the packet on the way in, it's not something you really want to read right now. You probably want to read it later tonight when you're trying to get to sleep because it's a real cure for insomnia. But it's broken down by a lot of different uh, measures that we use through something called uh, Whooper. Now I'm going to invite Mandy up here to talk about what Wolfer is all about. Is that what you did the last couple of days? <laughs> Wisconsin Uniform Financial Accounting Requirements are a set of uh, code numbers, and every tiny expense and every tiny piece of revenue coming into our district and going out has to be has to have attached to it a Wolfer code. No matter if you're buying a pencil <clears throat> or if you're buying a boiler. It's got to have a woofer code attached to it. And we track every expense and every bit of revenue in a lot of different ways. That's why it's so tough to just give you a nice, concise packet saying this is what our budget is. Do you want it organized by object? What you're buying. Do you want it organized by location? Who's buying it in the district? Do you want it organized by function? What are you using that item for? There are a lot of different ways we can organize it. Uh, the 10 is the fund. You probably could have guessed that. General fund. We've got Fund 10, Fund 21, Fund 27, 49, a lot of different funds. That's the general fund. E just represents expense. The two that we have to worry about right now are expense and revenue. There are a couple other oddballs you don't have to worry about. Expense in Fund 10. 450 is the location. Location can be thought of as an office or a building or even a person. Okay, the principal at West High, uh, not your principal at North High here, okay, you have a responsibility that's huge. Right? Your location, 475, right? Yep. Has a lot of other expenses attached to it. 
my location, 800, has a lot of expenses attached to it. I kind of get all the oddball stuff where they don't know where to put it, they put it in my location. So it ends up in location 800. So if you see a woofer code and it starts out 800, that's my expense. And I'm tracking that budget, I'm building the budget, and I'm monitoring it throughout the year. Uh, 470 is the object. It's what is being purchased. And 470 ends up being textbooks. And the 100s are salaries, and the 200s are benefits, and the 300s are capital items, and the 400s are non-capital. And there's some rules. They aren't just random numbers that we just assign to a textbook. But in this particular case, 470 textbooks. So West High School is buying some textbooks, 124,000. I picked my favorite. That's the math function. Okay, that's what you're using it for. So it's in the fun 10 basket, it's an expense. It's being purchased by West High School, it's a textbook, and it's being used for math instruction. And there are rules, the 100,000s are instructional and 200,000s are not instructional. There are a lot of rules and we don't have time to get into that kind of detail. But just so you understand, generally speaking, what a Wolfer code looks like. And then the last three digits are project, and we can track a lot of different things that we choose to track with projects. Title money comes in and goes out and we track it with a certain project number. Sage money comes in and goes out, we track it with a certain project. <coughs> so now you already know more than 99% of the other people out there in school finance. Because you know what these numbers represent. Like, you maybe don't know all the codes, but if I were to give you the, the cheat sheet for this, it's, it's a three-ring binder with that fact. So I don't know if we can do that. Here's an example. Our budget organized by location. And location 100 is general elementary, and then following the 100, 101, 102, 103 are specific elementary schools. And you have them all in your packet. But here's a woofer code. Location 100, object 100 is teacher salary in the general elementary area. $11.3 million. We go down here. 100, 243, that's dental insurance, $292,000 for dental insurance, just for elementary teachers. Now this is just a sampling, but if I click on this guy over here, here's what you have in your packet. You have them all. So you want to see, all right, what is Carl Traeger spending in each one of these objects? Pupil travel, Carl Traeger is spending $150. Wow, how do all those kids get to school? It's in the general middle school area where we budget for student transportation. And the Carl Traeger budget, in Fund 10, because you're only seeing the general fund, in Fund 10, they're only spending $150 on student transportation. Now we've got another fund we're not talking about. It's Fund 21, and Fund 21 takes in a lot of donations that we use to spend uh, money out of to pay for kids going on field trips. A lot of times we get donated money to uh, use for students going on field trips. So you're not going to see a lot of that travel because it will be in Fund 21. For the purposes of tonight, I didn't even show you Fund 21 donations. But you can, you can go home and you can look at this if you want. I don't know how interesting it's going to be for you, but you've got all this data. If I go back, the next one is an example of an object. So now I've got it sorted by object. I just picked object 400. The 400s are non-capital objects. If you're going to buy a pencil, that's a non-capital object. Right? If you're going to buy a textbook, that's a non-capital object. So the 400s are non-capital, and 410 is supplies, and 411 is general supplies, and 412 is workbook. So you can already see how massive this budget becomes, because you've got fund 10, and then you've got all the different locations, and then inside of all the different locations, you've got all the different objects. So it gets pretty massive. It has a multiplying effect. And you've got that information. Here are the 100s. Here are the 200s, here are the 300s, 400s, and so forth. And that information is in your packet. Not going to go through all of them. Uh, the next one, example by project. The different projects that we track. This one ends up being the Webster Sage budget. So for the Webster Sage budget, do you think this stuff is going to be uh, items that will bring up for reduction? You have to be prepared. You start reducing some of these things, say goodbye to the revenue as well. And that's the case with a lot of projects. We use project numbers at the end that aren't 000, zero, zero to track revenue and matching the expenses going up. And again, here's the length of line. Here's save months, here's save years ago, here's all the commodities, here's the days of elementary, designation, summer school, Southern Woods, peer coaching, in service, custodial. A lot of different things.
things that we track and they're again organized by object. Teacher salaries, <coughs> salary aids, non non contract aids, and extra overtime hours. Example revenue. Just ten fund ten alone. Fund 27 have revenue, it has all kinds of revenue, including contributions from Fund 10, right? But just Fund 10 alone, this is the revenue that we take. And actually, this is just a sample. If we want all of it, click here. Here's all of it. Fund 10 revenue. Take a look at this one. Property tax that comes in to Fund 10. That's a big part of the revenue limit. What's the other big part of the revenue limit? Equalization aid. So state equalization aid, big chunk of revenue, there it is. Property tax, big chunk of revenue, there it is. Then you've got all these other oddballs that represent smaller amounts. Some of them pretty big. Look at the Title I revenue, $1.3 million. You want to cut Title I, you cut Title I, but you say goodbye to the revenue as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow night. I don't want to... Skip through that so quickly if somebody really was interested in one of those items, but there's a lot up there, a lot to digest. But you haven't, so in case you're having a hard time sleeping tonight, you've got it. Here's a massive one. This is our full staffing report, district-wide. This is how our district is staffed. So everybody can see clearly by looking at it. Just kidding, you can't see anything. Pretty big. But here are all of our locations, and here are the different types of employees that we have and the number of each one of them. Now if I only focus on middle school parents, here's our middle school parents. Carl Traeger has these different types of parents. Therapy, special ed, regular ed, interpreter, and health. Those are the different types of parents we have just in our middle school alone. Now this data will be available to you as well. As a matter of fact, if we go to this spreadsheet, Here's the whole thing, and it's blown up a little bit so you can't see it unless it's full sideways. But you can blow it up as much as you want if I just email you this and have this document in front of you. But you can also sort, if I want to sort the columns, if I'm talking about the different types of employees, if I want to sort by labels that begin with T, for example, begin with T would be teachers. Now it just sorts out all the different types of teachers. You've got business teachers, you've got deans, you've got department chairs, you've got math, you've got music, English, and what have you. If you want to sort the rows, you can sort by label filters that maybe start with an H for high school. And now you've got the two high schools and all the different teachers. And you can sort it by middle school teachers, middle school custodians, high school, what have you. Administrators, district-wide, We'll get on the, on the rows going down on the far left-hand column, different locations in the district, all the different columns, different types of employees. And you will have this as a tool. You can take it home, play around with it, see if there's uh, places that we seem to be staffed a little bit more heavily. But I will tell you this. Across our district, our demographics change. We've got certain schools that have far different needs than other schools. So at first glance, if you look at it and say, wow, there are sure are a lot of paras over in Washington, well, maybe the demographic at Washington is such that we need a lot of pairs at Washington. So you have to uh, consider some of those things. You can't just look at the pure numbers and say, boy, you guys are really staffing this place out of whack. What are you doing? Well, trust me, Mike Null spends a lot of time looking at stuff like this and staffing our district the way it needs to be staffed to address our needs. So you have to dig a little bit deeper sometimes. But you'll have this data available to you. That's why we have to have everybody's email address we can send it to you in Excel. Then you can... Okay, questions on that staffing report? We can talk a little bit more tomorrow night about how to use it and how to access these buttons and filter by this. Let's go to Merrill School 1, 1, 2 points 4. What is that? 3, 2, 3, 3. Uh, somebody else in the room probably knows exactly who these people are and exactly how they're uh, utilized in each one of those buildings. Also, be help at the end, license practice nurses. Interpreters are your sign language. Student who has diabetes, or you know, somebody who has more health needs than another child. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
much is the exact? Because you said 80 percent, but it's it's more closer to 76, isn't it? That's been on staffing. I mean, it's it's gone down. It's not at 80. I know that. We can make that number almost anything we want if we introduce some of the other funds that don't have any staffing. If we talk about Fund 39 referendum debt, you start pulling that in, you can manipulate that number. Okay. You start eliminating some of those, you can manipulate it. Fund 27, a lot of staff, a lot of staff costs. You can make those numbers go up and down. <coughs> so generally speaking, it's real close to 80. Uh, sometimes districts try to compare themselves to others by saying, how much do you spend on staffing relative to the 80-20 rule? And because of the flexibility you have of what you're going to include, districts kind of play around with that data. And, and right now, maybe we're a little bit on the low side because of some of the things that we're doing in, sorry, take you on this one, in Randy's area, right? But we're replacing some boilers, we're replacing some roofs, we're really tackling some pretty big maintenance needs right now. And because of that, maybe we're spending a little bit more uh, than 20% on the non-personnel. So you could be very right, it could be a little bit more than 80. Here's a, a data sheet that, again, you will have in your possession. It's in your packet. And tomorrow night we're going to offer some uh, suggestions or recommendations or a menu of budget reduction options. <coughs> Actually, I, I think there are 32 of them. 32 different budget reduction options in the amount of $8.2 million. And the target that we're after could be anywhere from about $2 million to maybe $3.5 million. <coughs> So worst case scenario, we could be talking about asking you to reduce three and a half million dollars worth of budget. We're going to offer some suggestions that equate to about eight point two million dollars. But you may want to create some of your own scenarios, some of your own reduction uh, items. And if you're going to do that, this sheet's going to be pretty useful. This sheet will tell you how much each one of these different staff members typically cost. Now we didn't do the average. We did the median after we took out all the partial FTEs. We've got 0.2s and 0.3s and 0.5s that we didn't want to include, so we took the full-time FTEs. We took the median. So a typical teacher position, a typical teacher, this is the salary, blended health, means about 82% of our people are on the family plan, 18% are on the single plan. So if we blend that, the blended health is this much, dental is this much, other benefits this much, total $72,000 approximately <coughs> for one teacher. And it goes all the way down to administrators, one administrator. There's a little bit of a variety in administrators, a big variance in, in cost, so to speak, but a typical one, $109,000. Now remember, this is what it costs the district to provide health insurance. Notice this number is a little bit different than this one. This is full premium and the HRA contribution. This is 85% of the premium because that's what we pay on behalf of our employees. We pay 85%, they pick up 15%, so that's why these numbers don't look like they exactly match. This number is a full premium. So if you're creating your own scenario and you're talking about, well, instead of 15% health insurance, what if we ask 16%? You can create your own scenario. In fact, I did some of the work for you. An additional percent of dental insurance is going to save us that much. Right now, I can tell you, we pay all of our employees' dental insurance. We pay 85% of our employees' health insurance, for the most part. You've got a rule that they have to live by to get to 15, they have to jump through some hoops with a health risk assessment. But, you know. Why doesn't this district look into having an insurance buyout? Other districts, like Nina just had an article in the paper recently about how um, they saved over uh, $500,000, half a million dollars. And, I'm looking at my phone because of seeing the I know is. Appleton is doing it, Kimberly is doing it. Why aren't we at least looking into it? And if you read the paper alone, it might look like a pretty good deal. And if you talk to insurance industry experts, they won't say it's as good of a deal. And to illustrate that, I'll call on Dr. Dunlop again. He and his wife both work for the district. And we pay one family plan, 85% of which. And only one of them is insured through us. 
and let's just say it's Dave for argument's sake. So we insure Dave and we pay nothing to insure Marcy. And we pay nothing to Marcy and we're not getting anything from her and we're not paying anything to her. I'm another example. I'm really close because of the 15% my wife has great health insurance. We happen to be on my plan. If that needle moved a little bit, I wouldn't be on my plan anymore. I'd be on my wife's plan and the district wouldn't have to pay me anything. So insurance industry experts are saying that if you can encourage people to get off of your plan and not pay them or not take double employee families like the Gunlock family and not pay them because previously we weren't paying them. If we introduced a buyout, we would start paying Marcy ten or five thousand dollars. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I just have a problem. With, well, I don't. I don't understand why. And I don't. Maybe we should get into this in another session. But uh, it, it just seems to me if they put it in the paper and the district is saying that they saved half a million dollars, are they wrong? Relative to what? Relative to did they bring in a half million dollars in revenue? Whereas the Gunlock family, we were paying nothing to Dave's wife, but now we have to pay her five thousand dollars. Because now she's not taking our insurance, and we have this program in place. The other, uh, my the other, situation where I would leave the insurance, right now you don't have to pay me anything to leave. You'd have to pay me $5,000 to make that same decision that I was close to making with no incentive. The, the other piece <coughs> of the insurance actuaries, when they, um, they may save it this year, um, the insurance actuaries would tell you that adverse selection will be there. Only those taking insurance who need insurance, your rates for those who will remain and the district share will go up and recapture that amount again very shortly. Because um, uh, if the pool of, of individuals are only the pool who need insurance, the total cost and expenditure to the insurance plan, whichever one you have, will be a percentage wise higher because you, um, you only have people who need the insurance. Now, just like, you know, if there are, um, our, our, our deputy mayor could tell us how many fires we have in, in we, we all buy homeowner's insurance. If everybody had a fire one year, the premiums would go up. If only those who needed to buy insurance um, because they knew this year they were gonna have a fire, then that was, um, it would go up. If we only insure those who need insurance, what remains, and, and I spent 12 years of, of uh, managing human resources and, and negotiating health insurance, we, you will get money in the first year, but for those who remain in the plan, the district will pay mega bucks because the true cost of the insurance, because insurance is simple. It's X amount of dollars in, X amount of dollars out, plus 10% or 8% or whatever the plan is to administer. And, and so um, I would argue that um, uh, they will regret that within a year. It's short-term thinking as opposed to long-term thinking on the cost of insurance. Yeah, I've really just been doing it forever, though. My wife is, I, we're benefiting from it. I mean, they've been doing it for years. Yeah, you're benefiting from it, but those who remain in the plan will not, nor will the employer. And I would benefit from it as well. If I should get it, I'm close to going to my wife's insurance now. If I got a two thousand dollar buyout, I'd jump on more. I'd take two thousand dollars and run That's what they offer. Plan. And yet, it's two, even though I'd be a winner under that scenario, I can't with a clear conscience after listening to all the industry experts recommend against it, I can't with a clear conscience recommend it. And, and I would be a winner. Really this is one of the main reasons why the uh, new health care laws required everyone to get health insurance. Because you need the healthy people to pay in as well as the unhealthy. Absolutely. Otherwise, insurance doesn't work. You also got to pay benefits if you want to retain teachers. If you've also read in the paper, there's a lot of school districts where teachers are going to other school districts because the amount of cutbacks in their original one, they're going for more pay in other school districts. So it has to be a balance if you want to keep a stable, experienced set of administrators as well as teachers. Absolutely, and I'm glad you said that, because you will hear me say that a lot in the next few days, and, saying, and having more people saying that, it just gives it that much more well, I think a lot of people are under important. the impression we've got to cut something, cut, cut, boy, look at that, they're getting all that. And then you've got to slow down a little bit, and you have to look at the end.
end result you know, do we really lose in the end with the experienced teachers? Absolutely, that's going to be a common theme throughout the rest of this process. Uh, reductions that we propose that affect take-home pay in any way, is it going to attract and retain the talent that we have right here? And it, it won't, but to what degree it will is what we have to really assess. Well, following up to what Dick said, too, the cost either the school district or the city to recruit people you lose, you, that has to some has to be factored in, too. It's a, it's a, and the cost of training new cost people. To recruit yeah. qualified people. Absolutely. Kim Brown, back to you. All right, so again, we've heard a lot of information. We want to take some time to let you reflect individually on your own. So you're going to receive a sheet with a square, a circle, and a triangle. And the square is just going to be simply something that you learned today that squares with your beliefs. The circle, a question going around with your mind. And the triangle, two points that you want to remember. So we'll hand these out. And uh, if you would fill that out before. Uh, and then Bob's going to finish up. So you mean while they're doing that, I'll finish up? Sure. Well, let's have a little bit. Thank you so much. I just want to preview a little bit of what we're going to be doing tomorrow night and beyond. Tomorrow morning, we're going to send you an Excel spreadsheet, and that Excel spreadsheet is going to have some of those reduction items, the menu of reduction items. And it's going to have an area where you can prioritize them and sort them. And that's a lot of the work that you're going to be doing in the committees. Uh, also, the staffing report, you're going to get that. You're going to get a sample of what a prioritized list will look like when you're done with this process. We're going to have a target by February 12th. So for the second part of this process, we're going to be for three days in February, you'll have a target. And that target will be $3 million. We'll ask you to prioritize a list that goes 10% beyond $3 million. The nature of being a prioritized list, but it'll also be 10% short of $3 million, which is important as well. And maybe that targets off by a little bit. So we'll start talking about a little bit more of the specifics of that list tomorrow. We'll get a little bit more specific about a lot of this stuff, but hopefully tonight got you a general understanding of how we got in this position and the exact position that we're in. Some of the things that we maybe can change and some of the things that we really can't change, at least short term. So if you want to bring your laptop tomorrow night, if you have one, each group will have to have a, a computer. And we'll try to se separate the groups so there's at least one district employee in every group and we'll have computers available and they'll have log on privileges and all of that stuff. But if you want to bring your own laptop, you wouldn't need the internet for this, but I think Dr. Gunlock would probably make it available. I think there's enough capacity to have all these people on our wireless, no problem. Oh, oh yeah. So you're welcome oh, to bring yes. your laptop tomorrow. Plenty. <laughs> we are good to go. So you can play around with those spreadsheets. It can be a little bit more interactive, keep you awake a little bit more. Uh, it's at 6 o'clock again, right here tomorrow night. Any questions before you leave? I would just like to um, add uh, once again my thanks for your patience. I know it's a long endurance contest, and I think we're good at this. Uh, for, uh, for time, why not put the wrist left rather right? than try to clock the ball? But, uh, uh, but it, it is, um, I know it's a lot to absorb, but um, all of us will be um, always available to answer questions along the way and to try to help with um, uh, uh, the additional pieces. Um, uh, I want to especially thank. Um, uh, uh, Bob Tess for um, his his work. Um, he has he has put in. I, I would hate to think the hundred hours plus that he is plus to put in and present um, and have organized in his fabulous moving charts, which uh, uh, are moving uh, uh, pieces to show you uh, variations. Uh, uh, the wonderful math teacher, I'm sure he was, came, comes through very well in all of this and. Um, uh, and for his efforts to make sure that um, we uh, did the best possible delivery on the basics of school finance, which will continue tomorrow night. So with that, thanks so much, and uh, we'll hopefully see you all return. We hope that we don't have any um, dropouts on, <laughs> on the way. <laughs> but um, we are so grateful for your being willing to be a party to this. So thank you so much.